Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Mathieu Rieu, I'm the CTO and founder of BlockCypher, and we're similar to uh, Amazon Web Services for blockchains. We enable companies to build blockchain applications easily on our infrastructure. Uh, we've actually rebuilt the whole blockchain infrastructure for the from the ground up, so we can enable blockchain multi-tenancy and have any blockchain running in parallel at the same time whether they're private, public, in between, um, and we do that at scale. So today I'm going to explain you a little bit the basics of uh, blockchains, sort of what's the, um, the lingo and a little bit um, the, the background and what's happening under the hood with the main structure that are composing a blockchain. And then uh, toward the end we'll be a little more future looking, uh, looking at new developments and um, smart contracts and um, possible future interesting developments. So a little show of hands, who's heard here about the blockchain before? Uh, that's pretty good. Um, and like, keep your hand up. <laughs> uh, keep your hand up if you knew that the blockchain includes a programming language. OK. So at the end of this, most of you should A, know it, and then have a better idea than most of what that programming language can look like. So a little bit of definition first. Uh, it's very confusing when you talk about blockchain because people have heard about Bitcoin, heard about crazy currency, heard about um, a protocol, heard about all sort of uh, different aspects of it, a peer-to-peer -peer worldwide network. Um, and it can be a little confusing to put all these pieces together. It's a little bit like finding where United Kingdom is in this picture. Um, it's a little hard to circle. So I'll do a little bit of definition first. Um, Bitcoin with a little b is the currency. What everybody heard about, you can buy drugs with or things like that. Um, you can buy all sorts of things with it. Uh, and then Bitcoin with the big B is the technology, the protocol layer, um, and the sets of um, um, yeah, protocols and infrastructure that builds that. The blockchain is what support Bitcoin, but also any number of similar technology. It's the underlying platform. Blockchains can be private, Federated or public. What you all know about are the public blockchains. They're fully trustless and um, can, are much more consumer oriented, can uh, enable all sorts of alternate use cases outside of the currency too, but the currency is what most people heard of. Um, and then there's a more in-between scenario, which is the federated blockchain, where it's not fully open. It's still somewhat open between the different institutions that compose the federation. Um, the environment is more semi-trusted. It's not trustless. And it allows instant reconciliation, um, instant clearing within, within the boundaries of that federation. The private chain is more um, a database. Uh, but it's a database that runs within your walls. And the advantage of it is interoperability. You can, it's a known framework. All the concepts I'm going to talk about are fairly common now. Um, and so you can, you can compare it to SQL for Ledger, or yeah, that type of image. So from a software standpoint, uh, I'm not Satoshi, although I know. My wildest dream, maybe. Um, so historically, um, Satoshi came up in 2008 with a white paper that got a lot of people excited. Well, actually, not a lot, because at the beginning, nobody knew. But, uh, and then 2009 released some software that implemented most of the concept um, in the white paper. The software that he released was mostly for him and his friends to run on their laptop and desktops. Um, Satoshi probably had the laptops, uh, on their laptop and desktops, and just, just send money to each other, um, mine, like see how everything was working, wor uh, work out the kings, come out with the few first versions of the protocol, etc. Um, that same software is still running now, and it's still running on almost any of the blockchain you hear of. So if you hear of like, the city coin or the bank coin and everything, it's mostly that software. 
The issue, though, is that Satoshi, while being brilliant and probably a genius in his own right, was not a developer and not a cryptographer. And when you look at the software, it can be a little scary. Um, so that software that I was saying is still running and everywhere, and it comes with all those limitations of its history and of um, the environment it's running in. And so bugs that are in the software that are known bugs have never been fixed because they need to remain compatible. There's all sorts of limitations, um, like the size of a block, the number of signature, of a signature of operations in a block, uh, the number of transactions, uh, all sorts of limitations that in general you will not want to do with. And that's one problem that we set to fix at Block Cipher uh, because we rebuilt, as I was saying, all the infrastructure from the ground up to be generalizable and have those more properties that can be configured. From a use case standpoint, uh, I'm sure you've heard about all sorts of different things. It sort of depends which, which vertical you're interested in. And um, for many of these use cases, we barely just started to scratch the surface. Uh, lots of people are looking at lots of different applications from uh, finance like today, but um, other things like aviation and um, different environments. So um, popular use case is asset trading and exchange and value exchange in general. Um, and the blockchain allows for immediate settlement on all of these. Uh, another use case is identity related. Everything that's KYC, blockchains are really good at that because you can crypto cryptographically verify identities and then easily repudiate or easily transfer if that um, identity is compromised. Uh, another popular use case uh, would be documents, embedding uh, hashes of documents on the blockchain so you can prove that it existed at a given point in time in the past and then say, hey, I have that piece of data later on if anybody asks. In general, though, a blockchain is a distributed ledger. And so everything that is keeping records, um, keeping hand of all those transactions that are going in the, le in the ledger, all of that, uh, blockchains are really good at diminishing those costs. So let's look a little bit more at the detail what blocks, transactions, and scripts look like. So those are three blocks. Um, blocks all have headers. The headers have classic things in them, like timestamps and versions but they also have a proof of work here, which is basically a big number that just proves that somebody has been expending a lot of effort in building that block and is not gonna cheat on the validation of it. So all blocks are validating, and that proves that that validation was done correctly. Um, blocks are identified by their hash, which is basically the hash of the header, so the hash of the information that I just mentioned, and um, they're threaded, so each block points toward the one before it. And they form this way a chain that can be very long. Um, also, as you can see, because a block points toward the block that was before it, you can have several blocks that claim to point toward the same one in the back, which creates a fork. So practically, it's more of a tree than a chain. But consensus is always final based on the length of the chain. Every block, and that's the main role of the block, include transactions. They group them, and then you have the guarantee that all the transactions in the block are fully validated and correct. Here are two transactions um, that fit in two different blocks. Transaction on the left was inside block 49. Transaction on the right was in block, block 52. Transactions have inputs and outputs. The way to think about outputs is uh, inputs and outputs is the inputs is a spend, the output is a new locked amount of money that can be spent later. So transaction one spends a previous $50, uh, through input one, and then we distribute, uh, distributes it in two, input, uh, two outputs, output one and two. Output one is $15, and that goes to Alice, and you can see it because our private key is there, and output two goes to Bob, and that's $35. Then transaction two spends transaction one. So you can be pretty sure that Alice is the author of transaction two because she is able to spend her money. Or she shared a private key, which she shouldn't, really shouldn't have done. Uh, so transaction two in input one 
spends output one, and then you have two other inputs that brings $40 and $25 from other transactions, assumingly, and we distribute it to two outputs, output one and two in transaction two again, which are $70 and $10. And that, you can assume, is Alice paying Bob, because the $17 is for Bob. The other little um, gotcha is that when you spend, you have to spend all, all existing outputs. So here is there's $80 coming in, and if you want to pay Bob only $70, $70 then you need change, and that's output two, where $10 is sent back to Alice. So it's a little like complex overall, but if you, uh, if you uh, run it through your head um, with a little attention, you'll see how it all fits. Basically, you have inputs and outputs. Outputs lock money, and then inputs coming after that spend that money and redeem it. It works with a pass lock and a new way, a key to unlock that lock. The way all of that takes place is through, is through crypto. There's actually there's not locks on the blockchain. Um, there's signatures and public keys. So that script is in pretty much every single transaction. I can tell you right now there's about 10 per second that's going out um, with that exact script. What it does is, um, so the, the right-hand part of the script is in an output, and it's the locking function. It's a function that expects some parameters, and depending on the parameters, it will say, yes, this is valid, or no, this is not valid. Uh, it's encoded as an output again, and a new spending out, uh, input will reference that output and provide the signature and the pub keys, which are on the left-hand side. When those pieces are put together, you get the function on the right-hand side, the arguments on the le left, left-hand side, and when you run all of that, it's supposed to return true, which means that you can spend the transaction. So if you look at the script in a little detail, and we won't go too much into it, but um, it verifies first that um, the, pu the public key we're getting passed matches a previous hash of that public key. So basically, the script on the right-hand side expect a given public key and won't work with any other. So you have to give the right public key, which in our previous example is the Alice public key. And then the second thing it does after having verified that the, the public key is the, right, is, is the right one, it verifies the signature. And the signature is the part that says, I have ownership of the money because I have the private key. And the signature signs uh, both validates that the right private key, private key has been provided, but also that is the right transaction. So you have the right to spend the money because you signed that transaction and it's the right public key that matches it. So all of that, it's fairly complex when you go into the details and there's tons more detail that I could share with you. I know they are for two hours and you'd get really bored. Um, or I, mean, I don't know, maybe you're really excited, it depends. Uh, but uh, it can get fairly involved. And then there's a ton of different blockchains, blockchains that are seeing the light of the day every day. There's an explosion right now of different type of blockchain, whether it's public, it's private, lots of people looking at this problem, trying different use cases, doing proof of concepts. Um, and that's where we play. We are um, a web service company. We host blockchains. We run blockchains, whether they're big and um, used by tons of people, like the Bitcoin blockchain, or whether they're private and for you to run a proof of concept. Uh, and we make it so that it's much easier. All you have to deal is simple JSON with HTTP endpoints, simple APIs. So that's a list of all of them. You're not really supposed to um, check every single one. It's just to show you that whatever you have in mind, whatever your use case is, uh, we have an API to help you and to get you started pretty quickly. So now, continuing further on our um, little blockchain programming language journey, uh, we'll see what happens when, um, well, you add more instruction to that programming language or you make it a little more fancy. Uh, everything we saw right before is just one single shape of function. That's all there is. And that allows transfer of money in a trustless environment. What, what happens when you add more instructions? Well, you can do all sorts of things. First one is, first example I'll take is um, assets, asset exchanges. 
And instead of exchanging some kind of token, you'll exchange actual assets, which can be anything. They can be like cattle, gold, or Google stocks. The way this is done is still our transaction with inputs and outputs. Same thing. Transfer like inputs, um, spending past assets this time, and transferring it to new outputs that also have that asset. The main difference here is just that you have that little additional output, which has a return operation in it, that just marks the transaction as having that asset. The return just um, aborts and say, this output, you can't even like, process it. It's just locked forever. So it can be seen as a problem, but practically it doesn't matter because that output will have zero value. But it's used as a way to encode the asset ID that comes right after, and the asset ID is what shows I'm dealing with Google stocks, or I'm dealing with cattle. And that way, you have a distributed ledger, or a, you can distribute it only within a federation, but very easily, you can transfer assets from person to person. And it's reconciled instantly, um, and has none of the issues of night batches and stuff like that. Generalizing further, you can see that we've dealt with a very simple language, but what happens if you deal with a language that has all the expressiveness for us Python, Ruby, or JavaScript? That's what a smart contract language is like. So here, we'll take the example of Ethereum, but there's been different tries of uh, uh, standardizing different languages. Um, and with that sort of expressiveness you, expressiveness, you can build complex instruments, like loan agreements like um, nested ledgers, so you can build a ledger of ledger and sort of build suite transfer in between them. You can build um, full marketplaces or oracles and autonomous agents and crazy things. Here we'll see a very simple uh, example. It's pretty much one of the few ones that fit in a single slide, uh, but it's a full central bank. So I know like banks would love to have their own central bank, so you just like, copy and paste this. Um, it a very simple contract again, but it just works beautifully. Uh, you have a minter. The minter is allowed to issue the currency. So as an example, say here we're in California and we want to make California independent. And we don't want to rely on the US dollar. We'll have our own currency. Um, and I just want to be the minter because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm the one who's talking. So um, I'll start and I'll mint a whole bunch of California dollar. And then from there, that money can be transferred to people. So I can give everyone 10 California dollars just for being here. And then you can query the balance, just people who can do more transfers. And again, it all relies on the blockchain and the crypto that's behind it and um, how all that ledger is maintained. So simple contract, but very strong possibilities. So as a financial institution, and uh, pretty much anyone involved in finance right now, but anyone also that has to deal with um, anything that's ledger-like, um, that means value transfer, should really be looking at this. Uh, you can just pick a use case. And the use case can be something that's really dear to your heart in your own organization, or it can be just something to start getting, start getting your feet wet. So pick that use case. Um, Get a sandbox, we can create one for you really easily, just like, contact us, and it um, doesn't take long, or actually it's much faster than your lawyers who sign an NDA. Um, and then in a month, you can build your first proof of, of concept. Uh, a month is short, but you can have something out there, especially when you use APIs uh, that simplify things a lot for you. And then you can refine, repeat, and build a full product. And maybe five years from now, We'll have change finance. Thank you.